Hey, give me, give me like two seconds. I'm uh, actually at. Are we there? Yeah. Good to go. Good to have you on, my man, Roger Norbeis. Is that how you pronounce it perfectly? Uh, no, not at all. But you're white, so you get some leeway there. It's it's not advice. <laughs> not advice. There you go. That's a bummer because I speak Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> well, keep working on it, brother. You'll get it. Yeah, that's funny. So how you doing? Good, man. Good. Just, uh, you know, trying to uh, survive all this craziness with this corona bullshit that we're all dealing with. Yeah, I feel that. So usually we start out these podcasts with uh, just basically just telling your story a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Let people get to know you. Uh, and, and, and it is HGF. Uh, you did fight in the UFC and other organizations and so like obviously you have that as well but uh you know you just get to do you still compete in jiu-jitsu i see you still out there you know yeah yeah definitely yeah how'd definitely you, man how'd you, how'd you get your beginning in the martial arts um actually i started martial arts uh years ago man probably i was i was probably six seven years old when i got my start um and I started, you know, in a traditional martial art, which is Taekwondo at the time. I trained under uh, Master Clifford McKenzie here in Corpus Christi, Texas. Uh, you know, God rest his soul. He passed away uh, about two years ago. Um, but I was really hardcore into that, man. I, I started competing at a young age. Um, I got my second degree black belt. I did that for about nine years. Um, and, you know, I was I was pretty legit at that. I, I uh competed around the state uh we didn't really have a lot of money so i couldn't go like on a national level although i did qualify for like the junior olympics and stuff we just couldn't afford it and we didn't know my parents didn't know shit about fundraising back then so you know i did uh, as much as i could there and then you know i got to i got to uh, middle school and high school and and honestly nobody thought taekwondo was cool everybody you know uh was into football baseball all the typical jock stuff uh all the girls didn't really give a crap about me, you know, uh, doing the Taekwondo thing. They were more excited about seeing me run out in that football field. So that's kind of what I gravitated towards, um, you know, throughout my high school career. And I was pretty successful at that. I actually didn't pick up uh, doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and getting back into the martial arts till like my early 20s, probably about 23. Um, I started doing it again. Uh, actually, one of my buddies, that I played high school football with. He was a couple years older than me, but we went to the same high school. And um, Hector Munoz, you know, he he was kind of making a name for himself, not only on the grappling scene, but uh, on the Texas MMA scene. Um, he was one of the bigger names, not only in, in you know, our city, but, but in our state, um, getting national recognition and fighting for bigger organizations. So I started training with him. And, um, you know, the first time I trained with him, he submitted me about, 10 times in five minutes and he was only about 170 pounds at the time I was a good 260 270 and uh I was just like man I need to I need to I, I need to do this you know I'd always watch the UFC I knew what jiu-jitsu was but I had never actually done it and I had never actually felt what it's like to be helpless with somebody that is that much smaller than you and uh so it was an eye-opener and, um, you know, once I dove in, man, that was pretty much it. I just, uh, you know, was doing jujitsu anywhere from four to eight hours a day, whether it be studying on the, on the internet or, or doing multiple classes a day. Um, I would just immerse myself in it. And, uh, it's been that ever since. Nice. And so you ultimately, did you ultimately get your black belt from Hector? Yeah. Yeah. I got my black belt in 2000 and what are we in 19? So I got my black belt. It would be six years this August, this past August 24th. Yeah. So I, I think in 20, 2012, I got my black belt. And, um, you know, at that time I hadn't really done much as a black belt. I didn't really compete in jujitsu all that much. Um, because I was so focused on MMA, you know, uh, uh, jujitsu blessed me in that way where it, it kind of opened some doors for me, uh, on the fighting scene. You know, I started competing for Fight to Win uh, when they were first starting out. And then I just kind of went through the circuit uh, here in Texas of doing jujitsu and decided to throw my hat in the ring 
and uh, you know went four and zero as an amateur MMA fighter, and then I was six and zero as a pro before I got the call up uh, on short notice to fight my fir- first UFC fight, and then um, you Where know was that? where was your first one at? Man, of the worst, one of the worst places it could have been was uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. I've never, I live in Corpus Christi, Texas, so we're sea level, man. We've got, we got to deal with humidity and mosquitoes, but it's totally different when you're dealing with elevation. And I don't think I've ever been out of the state or, or out of, you know, anywhere near, near that. So it was definitely a shocker. Um, and uh, yeah, that elevation was, was hell, man. I mean, given that I fought, I fought Patrick Cummins, who, you know, he, he fought Daniel Cormier, his first, his debut and, and Daniel freaking smacked him around pretty good. But I think a lot of people didn't realize how, how good of a fighter Cummins actually was. And, uh, you know, I didn't underestimate him by any means, but, uh, you know, there's a reason that there's divisions in the UFC, the the heavyweight and middleweight and, and, uh, that fight was just a reminder that if I was going to compete at that level, I, I needed to uh, drop down. I wasn't going to be able to to handle the size and strength of guys at, at 205 at that time. Did you, did you end up dropping down or not? Yeah, yeah. My next fight, I actually took on Luke Barnett. I dropped down to 185, um, and I beat him. Uh, I was like a 6-1 to one underdog in that fight, and I ended up uh, – I dropped him in the third round with a head kick, almost finished him a couple times, uh, had some chokes on him that he freaking fought his way out of pretty, pretty good. And, and, uh, he was able to survive the last round. Um, and I won a split decision that fight. And then my last fight with him, I fought Elias Theodoro, who I was, I had won the first round and then the second round came and, and, uh, it was pretty close. It was a close fight. It wasn't the most exciting of fights, but it was close. And then, uh, he threw a kick. I blocked it wrong, broke my arm, kept fighting for as much as I could, but he ended up getting a takedown against the, the fence. Um, and I basically had one arm to defend with. So, you know, they called it off. I, I, I couldn't blame the ref because I mean, I was in a defenseless position, just trying to cover up and, and explode up when I could, but, you know, when your forearms split in half, it's kind of hard to uh, oh, yeah. to fight. So, you know, that was that was pretty much the end of my run. Um, I was part of one of the biggest layoffs in, in UFC history. I think they let something like 100 fighters go um, because they were just over inflated with fighters at that time. And uh, it sucked because it, the way it happened was kind of dirty, man. Like I had actually gotten a contract extension um, uh, because I was on the last fight of my contract. So after I broke my arm, they called, they actually wanted me to fight in Houston on the Gustus and Cormier card. And I was out of shape. I had been drinking and eating and not, not taking my recovery the smartest. And I said, you know, that was kind of an eye opener. I said, shit, I'll be ready by December. Just let them know I'll be ready by December. Well, three weeks later comes and they're like, Hey man, they decided to uh, go ahead and let you go. And uh, that was pretty much it. That was after getting a, a, a extra three fights and getting a pay bump, you know. Um, so they Dana White called me and I spoke with him and he kind of tried to compensate me a little bit for for letting things go the way they did. But you know, as, as a fighter, you don't want to be given money just to be given it. You want to kind of earn a full paycheck and and have an opportunity to win that uh, win that extra bonus money, you know. So. It is what it is. It, it ended like that for me. Um, but, you know, I can honestly say, uh, you know, it was a dream of mine come true um, just to be on a stage that big, to be the first person from Corpus to uh, represent on that level. Um, and, uh, you know, yeah, it was it was a great experience. Were, now, were you doing uh, your jiu-jitsu school and – uh, running all of that, at this, and I also know you're a firefighter, you know, so yeah. you're doing, you doing this all at the same time? Yeah, man. I mean, pretty much, I didn't have my own school yet. I didn't start my school till 2016, um, but I, Hector was running a school, and I was pretty much second in command, so, you know, I was probably running 50% of the classes at the time, getting my own training in, and then I worked full-time you know, that, that was the deal with the fire department is like, I would have to work my, my schedule around and get my vacations 
around certain time periods and have people work for me, uh, pick up my shifts and then I have to pay them back at a later time. But it was, it was all, you know, for that, I had to deal with all of that while still training two to three times a day, getting your strength and conditioning in. Um, and then everything else that, that, you know, uh, being a fighter entails. So it was, uh, it was definitely tough. Um, but you know, I'm a pretty motivated and, and dedicated individual and, um, you know, a lot of people probably wouldn't have been able to do it, but I had my mindset on, on fucking doing something special and, uh, you know, so I did what it took and um, it was a big sacrifice for me and my family at the time. But, you know, I had support of, of friends, family and, and my team. And, uh, you know, we we did something kind of cool by, you know, making yeah. it to the level yeah. that we did. That's awesome. So on a, on a little bit of a side subject there, being a current firefighter, do you notice anything different right now in society in terms of calls or anything like that with this uh, quarantine? Yeah, man. Honestly, it's kind of crazy that it's um, it's slowed down quite a bit. Um, we're not getting people don't want to go to the emergency room. People are freaked out right now. You know, you get calls on the ambulance for all kinds of stupid stuff. I mean, I've made calls for people that, you know, have stubbed their toe, literally like stubbed their toe. I had calls for people that oh, I've had a headache for the last 30 minutes, like oh, you know, my baby just coughed. Like, I've had so many just off-the-wall things that makes you wonder how people actually made it through life <laughs> um, on their own, you know. <laughs> but but for some reason now, people are like, hey, maybe I don't need to go to the hospital because I've, only, I've had a fever for four hours today. You know, maybe I don't need to go to the hospital because I have a little headache. Like, people are, are actually only calling for... for uh, you know, uh, things that they actually need to go to the hospital for now. So we've, we've seen a, a slight decrease, um, in call volume, definitely. Um, and, and it's alleviated some of the resources there in the, in the emergency room. Um, but, but yeah, as, as far as everything else, man, I mean, everything else seems to be, you know, running, running pretty smooth here in Corpus and, and uh, our, our team did a really good job. Our, our uh, department, our city management did a really good job of kind of getting ahead of this thing before um, it got any worse. And uh, we've seen definitely great results. I mean, I think we're at 90 people right now with only one death related to COVID-19, but it was somebody that was had pre-existing illnesses and they were in their late 70s. So, you know, um, it's not like we're having you know, crazy amount of cases pop up here. Um, and I think it's because of the uh, precautions that everybody's taken, you know? Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, I hadn't really talked to any uh, firefighters or police officers or anything like that, see if there's any difference in the quarantine at all. It's not me personally. I don't go out too much in terms of the public. Like, I mean, I rode 18 miles on my bike with my eight-year-old the other day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, exactly. I lift weights in the garage. Uh, uh, you know, we go on bike rides around because I live in by DFW Airport in that neighborhood. Oh, okay. Section. You can hit trails and and ride in the neighborhoods without being on the main streets for hours. I got a hoop yeah. in the, a hoop in the front yard and a, a soccer goal in the backyard. You know there you go. There you go. We're yeah, you got to find ways to stay busy during this time, man. It's it's uh, you'll go crazy just staying at at home. Um, you know, fortunately, uh, I have a place where I can go work out. It's closed, but I have access to the place. So when I'm there, it's kind of just me and I wipe everything down before I leave. And, you know, I, uh, I'm not saying I do jujitsu, uh, at the gym, but let's just say that, uh, I try to stay as active with that as I can, uh, keep my group small. And, and, uh, you know, for me, it's, it's, you know, the thing with this is there's, there's a lot of science behind it either way, but I'm just of a different mindset, I guess. I mean, I take the precautions that you have to take, but at the same time, um, you know, I'm of the belief that this is a virus. It's, uh, you know, I don't want to say or compare it to the flu because we all know that it's much more deadlier, but at the same time, it's like I tell people, it's like, it's not going away. Like we've got to adapt. We've got to overcome. 
Um, we've got to take precautions and do the right things and not be as as open as we are with things. Um, and, and definitely people that weren't washing their hands before certainly are now. But um, to just shut down our entire lives over something that's obviously not going to go away. I mean, it's not like it's a disease that can be cured. It's, it's a virus. Um, so it's, it, you know, a vaccine will come, but shoot, we've had the flu vaccine for years and people, we still get 60,000 people a year that die from it. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to kind of move forward and, and open back up with the gym and, and start living our lives normal again within reason. You know, I'm not saying to pack the gyms with, you know, 50 people, 100 people and, and be careless and go back to the way things were. But I definitely think that, uh, you know, at least here in Corpus, it's, it's hit a point where, like, for the last five days, we haven't had one new case. Um, and like I said, out of 90 people, we've had one death. And, and that's because they haven't tested everybody. You know, we're, we're, all, we're very, they're very limited on who they're testing. Uh, fortunately, we haven't had any firefighters um, catch anything. Um, we've had a couple of firefighters' wives that have gotten sick that work in the uh, medical field, but they've, uh, you know, been able to pull through okay. Um, so, you know, we've we've definitely haven't seen uh, a lot of the impact that, that a lot of other people have. But, um, you know, I'm just like I said, man. I'm I'm of the belief. Call it stubbornness. Call it you know, whatever, I, I just feel like it's time, you know, it's time we got people that are losing their livelihoods that, that have worked their whole lives to have their businesses and family run things that are just closing down because there's no money coming in, you know, our economy's hurting, obviously. And, you know, I just think that there's ways that we can uh, approach this in a smart, responsible manner without just locking ourselves in our rooms and, and not ever leaving, you know. For sure. I'm too active for all the tests that test. Yeah, exactly. I'm the same way, man. I'm the opposite of you, though. Like, you get to at least go out and go to work and do things and interact with people. Like, my dad is 73 years old, right? He does the medals sometimes at the podium or, is, or works at the front of AGF with me. He, he uh, retired from working in the studios in Hollywood, California. He moved out to be grandpa out here, you know? And yeah, so I, yeah, for sure. Take him with me to some of the AGFs. But, I mean, he's had a bypass, you know, and he's got really bad asthma. I got really bad asthma. My son yeah. does. The girls in my family don't, lucky son of a gun. But, uh, uh, you know, so he's like, he's one of those people that is susceptible. So he's like, yeah, oh, I'm scared. So, like, we hadn't seen him. We saw him, like, a week ago. He drove by, and he lives down the street in the apartment. Yeah. Where he is his grandpa, you know what I'm saying? Like, and so yeah. he didn't even talk to us from his car. Like this came yeah. in front of our, we got our chairs out. And so then uh and then like four days ago for the first time he finally was like, All right, I'll come over and everything because he's more worried he's gonna get it from us, you know. But yeah, like, no, absolutely absolutely, man. And that and that's what I mean by like we gotta do it responsibly. I'm not saying like open things up and everybody there there's definitely a certain group of people that's a little bit more susceptible, even though there's been people that are like my age or younger that have caught it with no underlying illnesses um but but there is a group of people that's very much more susceptible to catch it and to suffer the the um you know the uh, extreme uh symptoms uh, including death so so yeah like for him definitely i mean don't get me wrong if i was in my 70s and had any kind of respiratory issues or any kind of heart issues i'd definitely be at home and it, as hard as it is like you said he's right down the street and you know, you're talking to you from your car, his car and stuff. It's like, man, those are the precautions that kind of need to be taken for now. You know. Well, he's got he's got some interesting things. He's not so much. I mean, don't get me wrong. He's got his own ideas. You know what I mean? Right. He's got this one thing that he believes kills it. Uh, not in terms of just Corona, but just flu and germs and stuff. So they got these UV wands. Have you seen yeah. those? And they yeah. got him room, they got him in rooms too. And so he got a, a bunch of info about that. He got me one. And you could wand a room even in the future when I go to AGF, I'm gonna go fly and stay in a hotel room. You know? Right. And you, you could wand that hotel room. It's crazy the extra precautions, but you know, those are some of the things that he's thinking about, like how do I protect myself? Because 
if this lasts 18 months, he don't want to be in top 18 months. Exactly. Exactly. So, like, so, exactly. Yeah. He's an and, and it is. Like, this is, that's what I try to tell people. Like, this isn't going away. So now we got to figure out how we can move forward and live without just totally isolating ourselves and going crazy and losing – losing everything that, that we worked so hard as Americans to get, you know? So, so yeah, I mean, and unfortunately it's just like when nine 11, you know, happened, like things will never be the same. And with this, things will never be the same. Like this is a big, this is the first time this is un unprecedented in my lifetime. Um, you know, that I've seen anything like this happen. So we're just going to have to figure out how to move forward and, and, and the best we can and be responsible. And like you said, it might be a standard thing where everybody buys one of those wands now and <laughs> walks around and, and does exactly what you, you just mentioned and, you know, uh, wands the room that they're staying in, you know, so. That's a trip. Well, let's, yeah, head, back yeah. to, uh, let's head back to, to martial arts and, and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So tell us a little bit about your uh, competition. We actually competed in San Antonio. I've seen you compete IBJJF, you compete at AGF, Fight to Win Pro. Uh, yes, sir. Tell us, tell us and, and and then not just jujitsu, but I've I've cornered high level fighters, you know, and you, so like I I have seen firsthand what it's like to have a guy walk out that hallway into a freaking cheering oh, stadium yeah. as, as a fighter. And I, I have all the respect in the world when I saw that, especially you you were saying Luke Barnett. I guess that's big slow, right? And uh, yeah, yeah, the big slow. Yeah, he was in Abu Dhabi when Bedford fought Pani Yaya in Abu Dhabi. And, uh, oh, okay. I got to hang out with him. Yeah, we actually exchanged weight cutting techniques. He's the one who got Bedford to really get into the uh, Epsom salt baths and wrapping in sweet sweat and towels and cutting weight that way instead of like in the yeah. sauna way. That was like when that was right. probably like, I don't know, six years ago or something like that when, when we were there. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, and so – Anyways, it's intense to compete, you know? So, like, what do you – what what goes through your mind? How do you deal with pressure? You know, do you enjoy the moment? Like, uh, where do your nerves go away? Talk, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, uh, man, I asked – I absolutely hate it. I make comments about being scared to fight and stuff like that. And I don't know if it's it's being scared. I think what it is, is just having those nerves, those butterflies, but I absolutely hate the feeling. It's like getting on a roller coaster. Like I was afraid of roller coasters. till I was like, I didn't start riding roller coasters till like my mid twenties. And, and I still, even though I've rode the, some of the fastest, biggest roller coasters now, like it's the anticipation. But once it's over, it's like this amazing feeling of just this, this amazing freeing feeling. And, and that's for me, that's what competition is, whether it be a jujitsu match or uh, an MMA fight um, and whether it be fighting in front of thousands of people that's, that's being televised all over the world or fighting in front of, you know, a hundred people that's in a, uh, a, a tent outside at, you know, at bike fest, you know, that was like my first pro fight was, a bunch of bikers at bike fest and set for uh, STFC and you know I'm under a tent no music no walkout music no nothing it was like get in there and fight and they're rowdy and I mean it was the same nerves that I felt you know when I was fighting on the undercard being televised for the uh Pettis uh, Dos Anjos you know championship bout in Dallas is it's just intense um but for me that's exactly why I do it I'm, I'm a bit of a I don't want to say I'm an adrenaline junkie because I don't do like a bunch of crazy stuff as far as like jumping out of planes or mountain climbing or like rock climbing or anything like that. Like I just truly am a competitor and I love to compete and push myself as hard as I can at whatever I do. I mean, we could be lifting weights, doing a CrossFit type workout and I'm going to try to smoke your ass every single time. And it's just the lead up to that, you know, um, Jiu-jitsu is the same way, man. I get super nervous uh, before any competition. I zone out. And then, you know, once we start going, once I touch my opponent, you know, my buddy always told me he, he uh, when he fights, those nerves are there. And it's like as soon as he touches gloves, that's why he liked to touch gloves because um, his name's Corey Bellino. And, and he was one of my coaches and good friends of mine. But 
he would uh he would say that man it's like as soon as we touch like it all changes like a switch just flips and for me it was kind of the same same thing except for me in a fight i do i do this stomp and everybody thinks you know they they have their reasons for doing things but when i go in i it's it's like they call me the silverback right so i do my gorilla stomp and it's just three stomps with my right foot upon entering the cage and for me that's where all the nervousness and all the bullshit quits that's where it's time to fucking step up and be and fight and go to war you can be scared all the way up until that point but when it's time to fucking go you better be ready to go and so for me that's when it's like all right that's when my switch flips and i let all the the nervousness all the doubt anything in my head just that is is not going to be positive for the fight it it goes away and i just become somebody else at that point and it's just go time it's it's you're in my fucking house and you know, to me, that's just disrespectful. I'm going to fucking end you. And that's, that's the mindset that I have. And the same thing with jujitsu, you know, they call it the gentle art and technical and this and that. Fuck that. I'm going to take down smash pass finish kind of guy. Like, yes, it is technical. And yes, you do have to know your technique and there's, but, but just my mentality with it is different. Like I'm going to make you as uncomfortable as I can. I'm going to put my fucking face under your chin when I'm trying to pass your guard. I'm going to drive my knee through your chest. I'm going to, you know, put my knee on your arm. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do whatever I need to do to finish the fight and, and or to advance my position. And uh, so it's kind of the same way. You know, I get nervous as hell. But once we slap hands, it's like, all right, it's go time. You know, and I, I tell my guys the same thing from kiddos all the way up. It's like, it's normal. It's normal to be nervous. Um, you know, some people say compete so much so that those nerves just go away and it's just like another day in practice. Man, I've, I've done hundreds of jiu-jitsu matches and I still feel that shit. So maybe some people can turn that off, but I'm not one of those people. I, I'm, I'm always um, nervous before every single match. I don't care if it's so like I'm just nervous and then when we start going it's like all right let's go it's it's it, the nerves go out the window I think it's I've never little, been it's an interesting subject it's it's actually something as a coach I talk to a lot too and and I have had a bazillion casual conversations about it and seeing people visibly nervous at AGF you know uh the jitsu side of the house on the MMA fighters like you had your three stomp thing, you know, that's, uh, it's your thing, you know? And then as I've gotten to notice, you know, two dozen fighters or something like that, you know, then you start to realize that some people play video games and chill. Some people want to talk yeah. a lot. People need to stay right. active. People want to do a little light warm up train that day. Some people want to, uh, sleep, you know? So, and then, but in terms of, uh, jujitsu tournaments, MMA is the same, but I've always had the feeling that, uh, through conversation and, and myself as well too, but like some people get nervous or stop being nervous when they step on the mat. Some people stop when they clap hands. Some people stop on the first uh, grip clinch, and then yeah. some some people in, they just do jujitsu mainly. I'm talking about like tournaments uh, or until they hit the ground. I actually I actually am a little bit nervous in in in, in jujitsu tournaments. Uh, like anybody, I think that the, what, when people say you need to compete a lot so it goes away, I think you just get better at handling it. I don't think that uh, it 100% goes away. You can get more calculated, I think. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, but I prefer when, once it hits the ground. In jiu-jitsu, I feel like uh, any form of phase of the stand-up period, it's too quick of movement to not have some form of, you know. Yeah. You know what? It's funny you say that because now that I think about it, it's that first grip. It's like once we grip up, that's when the nerves kind of go for me uh, yeah. when it comes to jiu-jitsu. Uh, because now you're in the fight. Now you have to think, you know, you have to think and, and maybe not even necessarily think as much as react. You know what I'm saying? And, and that's the thing I, I think that makes a difference. Um, and, and that's the thing about people like us that like to compete and test themselves is, is – you know, we're willing to put ourselves in that vulnerable position where we know we're going, there's a chance we could lose. There's a chance we could get hurt. There's a chance that, that we can get embarrassed in front of, you know, our, our loved ones. Um, but we just don't give a fuck. 
you know it's like we're we have a bigger purpose in doing what we're doing and competing and my purpose is whether i'm trying to prove a point to myself or prove a point to my students like there's always a bigger meaning you know behind why i compete and so i think that nerves take a back seat to my why when it comes down to it you know when when it really gets into the to 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 go in or, or gets into go time it's like all right th you're here for this reason so let's do it you know yeah that's cool well, that's interesting yeah i definitely think that that mindset is uh go get her mindset or our mentality you know what i'm saying it's a it, it's not a, it's not a passive mentality you know what i mean even some no. people are massive massive guard pullers and they can still be very 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 aggressive oh absolutely man I'm not one of these guys like that's like oh guys that pull guards are bitches. I said, you know, I seen guys that pull guard and fucking submit or sweep somebody like instantly. So, you know, you can think what you want about guard pullers, but when they're pulling guard to rip your ankle apart or you know tear your knee off, uh, you might think think differently of it after that. <laughs> and now coming with the MMA background, I understand there's going to be more nogi involved, and I've I've seen you compete. Uh, it, no gi more I would say I wouldn't say I've never I don't I think I've seen you compete in gi but um do you do that very often yeah um actually man I kind of made it a point once I started competing to focus more on the gi um you know I, I never really competed in gi as black as a black belt and so once I once I started competing for the IBJJF, most of the tournament, of course, with them, most of their tournaments are gi tournaments until this no gi season. And um, I, I had done like the world championships for no gi, and I had done um, uh, some like the Austin Austin Open for no gi and things like that. But mainly, I, I most of the tournaments that I frequented have been um, in the gi. And for some reason, the same thing with the super fights. Like when I, when I fight for Eric uh garcia or i fought for seth it's been it's been gi competitions and and i'm not one to turn shit down man like I, that's one thing about me and, and why maybe i've competed so much is because you know I, yeah i'm an mma fighter um but i'm a black belt and i've always felt like i needed to prove that i was a legit black belt because let's be honest there are definitely um some black belts out there that probably shouldn't be black belts and i never wanted people to look at me like that um i always wanted people to respect my rank and respect my abilities in jujitsu not because of fighting but because of my technique and um you know i feel like i'm at that point i i, I definitely uh feel that i can i can compete with the best of the best um in in the state um and, and i don't really think that there's you know anybody that can just run through me and and that might be ego i mean i think you you know when you're competing you have to have an ego you have to believe in yourself to that extent um but but i found that you know by competing in the gi it really gave me more confidence and and believing in myself and improving to myself once again that like hey i belong there so so i i do do some no gi stuff i have done it like the honor invitationals and I, I know agf i did uh no gi and actually i did the agf when i was getting ready for no gi worlds for the first uh time and um you know i've done no gi worlds a couple times and and uh, but for the most part, lately, it's been a lot of gi stuff. So I'm actually looking to transfer back into doing no gi. Um, we've been working a lot of leg locks, and there's a couple guys that are in Texas that think their leg locks are just the shit. But every time my name comes up, they kind of just uh, – I'm too big and heavy for them all of a sudden. Um, and that's why I respected you, man, because honestly, that day that we competed, I was like, fuck, I was nervous because – I remember watching you for the first time compete and you were a brown belt and it was for fight to win for one of their super fights. It was like an eight man super fight. And yep. you, you were going against Albert Hughes, who I think was a black belt at the time. He had just gotten his black belt and um, dude, you caught him with a calf slicer, like in less than a minute. And I was like, what the fuck? Like, dude, like it was a that. Cause, 50, 50, cause 50, 50, it was a 50, 50 heel hook. I turned into a new boy. It was that what it was? Okay, yeah, it was. It was something fucking slick at the time because I didn't know nothing about leg locks back then, and I was only a purple belt at the time. And um, I remember seeing that and being like, "Shit!" 
And then, so when we competed, I was like, I know you had, you know, you hadn't really been training as much and you just wanted to get, you were like, Hey man, I'm just trying to get some rounds in, Let, you know? And I was like, fuck it, let's do it. Because it takes a lot of balls to do that, dude. And a lot of people these days don't fucking have that. It's like, bro, it's jujitsu. Like nobody's going to punch you in the face. If you get caught in a bad position, you can tap. Like you're not going to get knocked unconscious. Quit being a pussy. And it's crazy. It's crazy because I talked to, I talked to Eric Garcia and dude, there are so many people that pull out of jujitsu tournaments for fucking no reason whatsoever. Like they come up with some bullshit. Like my dog, my aunt's dog's cousin's chihuahua passed away last night and well, I can't compete. With AGF, we, we closed registration on Monday. So that we, we've been doing that since the beginning. So we just, at least yeah. we get the details and we can fix the brackets. Cause like, exactly. Like, exactly. And that's those. great. And that's great for a tournament. But what about super fights when you got guys that are fucking training and then all of a sudden two weeks out, you get guys that, fucking that's ridiculous you know they they uh for lack of better terms they just uh lose their manhood all of a sudden yeah, you know crazy. and it, it just gets me because these guys are promoting 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 about the fight and i literally had somebody that like didn't want to fight me the dude had already beaten me before and he he didn't want to fight me um because he said he beat me at ibjjf and and like eric started promoting the match and then like, the guy just ghosted on him. He wouldn't even return his, his calls. And I'm like, bro, like, what do you got to lose, man? Like, fuck, it's just jujitsu. Like, it don't matter. Like, it, we compete. The, the essence of competition is not to win and fucking get a $3 medal or whatever. Like, the essence of competition is to test yourself and to prove to yourself that you're, you're out there. And there's so many guys out there that want to test themselves against weaker competition they don't even want to test themselves they just they just want to they just want to put on a show and it's this facade is this is this, this fake fucking persona that they're putting out there because like i'm i don't want to fight anybody i know i can smoke like i'm not gonna fight somebody like i've had a i had a guy one time that wanted to compete and he was like yeah we should do a super fight and he's like 150 pound black belt and i'm like bro Really? Like, and I'm not saying like 150 pound black belt can't beat me. Cause I know like Mikey Musumeci and guys like that, like world champion level guy, I'm talking about a, like a local guy. Right. So I'm like, bro, what am I going to get out of smashing you? Like I, that does nothing for me. Like I'm not, I'm not, I go to competition to, to fucking go against the best. You know what I'm saying? And there's just a certain mindset that some people have and some people don't. And, and and that's why I was, you know, bringing you up because I was like, man, it takes a lot of balls. I mean, I was probably about 230 pounds at the time. Um, and I know we're at least two weight divisions apart. Uh, I know at the time you were a little, a little heavier cause you hadn't been working out and stuff, but fuck man. We, uh, I was two, you know, two hundred five. but, that, but, yeah. it, and, you know, something I like to do about AGF, my partner Chris has competed in it before. And I recently, I was mid weight cut for fight to win pro when the whole lockdown happened. I was, I had done three tournaments in four weeks. It kind of went on a tear. Like you said, you know, I, you quit drinking beers and you get, yeah. you get motivated. You know what I mean? You get motivated. Hell yeah. Uh, and so I, I, I enjoy the, the fact that HGF affords me to be able to, I'm in Maryland, I'm in Amsterdam, I'm in Miami. I'm, I'm Hell all yeah. Over. And so, yeah. uh, I have also, and it's a le not as big of a day. Like Dallas is a two-day tournament. I'm walking around for two days dealing with drama. I'm, I'm coaching. Right. Uh, and so I like, I like competing in other places. To be honest, where I don't know anybody. Like I compete, right. in, I compete in Maryland or Jacksonville, Florida. Like I don't know any of those schools. And so sometimes that gives me the extra little edge of, uh, you know, you don't. There's not a local dude. This, this, you know somebody you could just test yourself against randomly. You know what I mean? Exactly. Exactly. No, that was the biggest thing with uh, IBJJF that I enjoyed was actually traveling. And that's when I really started to prove it to myself because I always tell my guys, it's not about being the best in Corpus. It's not about being the best in Texas. Like I want to be one of the best, not only in the United States, but against guys that travel from all over the world you know? And so that's why, like, when I go to the world championships and I'm able to submit this dude that's straight from Brazil and, and fucking, you know, uh, 
you know, my rank and stuff like, like to me, that validates, that validates everything, all my years of training, you know? So, so definitely, man, I mean, like, that's a great opportunity to be able to, to compete against various people from, from all over the world. Um, because it does that, it gives you that experience. And then it also, like you said, it valid, like I was saying, it validates the fact that, you know, like you belong there, you know? And it's also for me, I'm in a little bit different position. I'm, I'm like, this is fun. I'm here anyways. You do one every – how can you run a tournament every weekend and not compete? You know? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> no, like you're taking, you're, you're, you're taking advantage of the fruits of your labor, you know. It's like that's, that's your fucking like – you, you, You've got a free entry right there every time, you know. Why not, yeah. why not compete against these, these black belts? Hell, yeah, yeah that's, a, belts, that's a great – Black belts are always free at HGF. But Seth Daniels it, motivated me. You know, I see, I would see Seth competing on Fight to Win Pro against dudes, you know, and I was like, oh man, I got to do that more, you know? And so, yeah. uh, you know, I, well, and then Seth, I, I, Seth's hey. a G, man. Seth's a G. He just don't give a fuck, you know? And that's, that's why I like him and I respect him. And, and, you know, a lot of people are turned off by, by his tactics, but I think there's something about jujitsu is there's more real people in jujitsu than there are fake people. And so that's why he's been so successful because people just like the real fucking attitude like because when you think about it that's what jujitsu is like there is no faking jujitsu when you step on those mats if you're acting a badass you're gonna get your fucking you're, you you will find out how badass you actually are you know what i'm saying so yeah, Seth, the thing about so, Seth me though is like i've always uh, had a good relationship with him the first year that we were he was in business we would split the facility and have uh fight to win pro in the center at night and the AGF was the mats during the day you know oh and nice I, nice as i've been up to colorado train at his uh location where he was at uh when mike nichols was gonna fight Vinny mega hash i went up there to um uh, I, I i i was in the army so i go up to colorado quite often about once a year and uh uh he he like you said ran the super fight that i did when i moved to texas from cali and and i repped his tournaments but I think the biggest thing about Seth is like he has no filter, right? He, he, right. Uh, that's what some people get turned off. But for me, he doesn't screw people over. He's a good promoter. Exactly. He doesn't screw exactly. people over. He holds his word. He's honest. Uh, all that stuff, you know. But, uh, yeah, man. So I've always been a fan of Seth. I've always hoped the best for him. I hope he gets jiu-jitsu on TV for America, to be honest. Yeah. You know, hey, he's on the way, man. That, that would be awesome. You know, I think there's a lot of people out – out there that just hate on other people's grinds and they don't they don't want to uh, you know people they want to be the only one and i'm like what what fun is that like that's that's not what it's about it's like let's let's make this bigger so that we can all share in on it you know because ultimately that's what it should be about i mean jiu-jitsu changed my life you know what i'm saying so anybody that's just trying to promote the art let's go that's awesome yeah for sure all right, man. Well, I know you got a uh, Zoom with some of your uh, students, you know. Um, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Man, best of luck, you know, trying to get that business back open. Um, so, Thank you. You know, I know you're hustling. Anyhow, always, brother, it was great man. talking to you. It's always good getting to know people uh, during this, this time, you know. Yeah, yeah, for sure, man. Appreciate you having me on. It was, it was awesome to, to be on here and chat with you for a little bit. For sure. I'll let you know when we uh, get this all released. It'll be on iTunes, Google, YouTube, all that good stuff. Awesome, brother. Awesome. Just let me know. All right. Be safe, brother. All right. Take care.